Good evening and welcome to this virtual ceremony celebrating the 2020 HTC Distinguished Teacher Scholar Lecture. This year's recipient of this prestigious award is Dr. Carolyn Dillian, Professor of Anthropology and Geography. Our traditional celebration for Dr. Dillian was canceled in early April with the hopes that we could reschedule this fall semester. Unfortunately, we are still unable to hold this event due to COVID-19 restrictions. However, we are excited to virtually recognize Dr. Dillian and her many achievements. In addition to honoring Carolyn, I would like to take this opportunity to thank one of our most valued and trusted community leaders, Ori Telephone Cooperative, and its CEO, Mr. Mike Hag. Their continued support in the mission of Coastal Carolina University helps provide resources and opportunities for academic excellence. Enjoy this evening's virtual HTC Distinguished Teacher Scholar Lecturer. And again, congratulations to Dr. Carolyn Dillian. My name is Dan Ennis, and I'm the Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs here at Coastal Carolina University. And I'm pleased to help introduce our speaker, Carolyn Dillian, the HTC Distinguished Teacher Scholar Lecturer. Dr. Dillian's work embodies the spirit of this award. Not only is she a gifted teacher, who in the classroom has transformed students' lives, but she's also a remarkably accomplished researcher whose work in archeology span spans the globe, literally, from Africa to right here in Ori County. It is pleasant to think about the fact that her work in our region has helped us understand our community's origins and that her work as sponsored by this lecture is supported by HTC, an organization that also helps our citizens. With that, I am pleased to introduce Mike Hag, the CEO of Ori Telephone Cooperative. I'm Mike Hag, CEO of HTC. At HTC, we recognize that the investments we make today will determine our future success. Investments in our network, in our employees, and in our community. And it's that very same reason that HTC has proudly supported the Distinguished Teacher Scholar Award for the past 25 years. Because by recognizing today those individuals that excel in educating, enlightening, and developing our future leaders, we're ensuring a very positive and a very successful future. So on behalf of HTC, it's with great pleasure that I'd like to present Carolyn Dillian with the 2020 HTC Distinguished Teacher Scholar Award. Congratulations. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Carolyn Dillian, who is the 2020 HTC Distinguished Teacher Scholar Lecturer at Coastal Carolina University. Dr. Dillian is a professor of anthropology and the founding chair of the Department of Anthropology and Geography, which is housed in the Edwards College of Humanities and Fine Arts. She holds a Bachelor of Arts and a Master of Science in Anthropology from the University of Pennsylvania and a doctoral degree in anthropology from the University of California, Berkeley. Dr. Dillian is a widely published and highly recognized scholar and a passionate and dedicated teacher and student mentor. She's actively engaged in important local and international research projects, and she excels in providing experiential learning and research opportunities for her students that are grounded in uncovering our local cultural heritage and making it accessible to the general public in Ori and Georgetown County. Since joining CCU in 2010, Dr. Dillian has published three books. Her most recent publication entitled Misadventures in Archaeology, The Life and Career of Charles Conrad Abbott appeared just this year with the University of Pennsylvania Press. Dr. Dillian also is single author and co-author of more than two dozen peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters. She is actively presenting her scholarly work at prestigious national and international conferences. Many of Dr. Dillian's publications result from projects that involve her students in field work and in the research projects she directs, to name but a few. Since 2011, Dr. Dillian directs the Wadies Island Archaeological Project that includes an experiential field school experience for our CCU students. For more than a decade, she served as director of the Charles Conrad Abbott Research Project, work that resulted in her most recent book. 
From 2011 to 2014, she was the field co-director of an important international research collaboration, the Holocene Research Project in Lake Turkana, Kenya. Dr. Dillian's scholarly expertise is widely recognized as she also serves on a number of distinguished national and international boards and committees, including the Society of Experimental Archaeology and Primitive Technology, the International Association for Obsidian Studies, and the Society for American Archaeology. Since joining CCU, Dr. Dillian has demonstrated that she epitomizes the teacher-scholar model and that she is passionate about it. She actively involves her undergraduate students in her research, in field school, and a variety of other experiential learning opportunities. One of the most recent and noteworthy examples of Dr. Dillian's distinction as a teacher-scholar is her collaboration with Dr. Katie Stringer-Clary from our history department. Both instructors offer a unique class in the home departments on a shared topic and based on their disciplinary backgrounds. At the end of the semester, they bring the two classes together for a joint final project to teach their students about collaborating across disciplines and to bring different perspectives to the same topic or project. Last year, this cross-disciplinary collaboration has resulted in an extremely well-received exhibition at the Horry County Museum titled Printing the Past, South Carolina in 3D. Earlier this year, Dr. Dillian, Dr. Clary, and their students received an exhibition award for this exhibition from the Southeastern Museum Conference. The work of Dr. Dillian and her collaborators was furthermore recognized this summer when they received the Award of Excellence from the American Association for State and Local History. As the founding chair of the Department of Anthropology and Geography, Dr. Dillian has been very successful in launching a new and quickly growing BA in Anthropology and a new Certificate in Applied Archaeology. She is also actively involved in a number of critical community outreach activities. She serves as the co-director of the Bell Baruch Institute for South Carolina Studies at Hopka Barony, as a consultant and volunteer ad hoc for the Wakama Tribe of Indians in Aynor, South Carolina, and as a lecturer, board member, and reviewer on various Horry County institutions and organizations. Dr. Dillian is an exemplary teacher-scholar who truly deserves to be recognized for her outstanding work. It will be a treat for all of us to hear her presentation and to learn more about her exciting scholarship. Today's lecture, entitled Misadventures in Archaeology, Charles Conrad Abbott and the Evolution of a Discipline, will feature the life and career of Charles Conrad Abbott across the transition in archaeology from amateur hobby to professional science. This presentation promises us some unique insights into the life and legacy of a publicly discredited 19th century archaeologist. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Carolyn Dilliard, the 2020 HTC Distinguished Teacher Scholar Lecturer at Coastal Carolina University. Good afternoon. Thank you for this award and for giving me the chance to tell you about my recent research, albeit in this virtual format. Before I begin, I have a few acknowledgments and thank yous that I want to make. First, the project I'm going to talk about is a decade-long collaborative effort with my good friend and longtime research partner, Charles Bellow. Our book, Misadventures in Archaeology, The Life and Career of Charles Conrad Abbott, was published last spring by the University of Pennsylvania Press. I also want to thank HTC for sponsoring this award, President DeCenzo, Provost Ennis, and Dean Bornholt for their support and kind introductions. And finally, a huge thank you to my amazing colleagues and students in anthropology and geography. I am so fortunate to work with such talented, supportive, and kind people. Thank you for all you do every day. The story I'm going to tell you about brings together the study of the origins of humankind and the evolution of archaeology as a scientific discipline through the lens of the life of the cantankerous Dr. Charles Conrad Abbott of Trenton, New Jersey. Archaeology as a scientific field 
is often traced from antiquarianism to scholarly discipline. But that's a little overly simplistic. Men like Abbott, and occasionally women, published in scholarly journals, but were untrained and more concerned with collecting the relics of the past than addressing questions of archaeological provenience, explanation, or cultural context. Now, I should also acknowledge here that the evolution of archaeology to a scientific discipline paralleled similar changes to other disciplines during the Victorian era. Charles Conrad Abbott was born in Trenton, New Jersey on June 4, 1843, into a prominent, although not really wealthy, Quaker family. His father, Timothy Abbott, was a successful merchant and a banker. His mother was Susan Conrad, daughter of Solomon White Conrad, who was a professor of botany and a lecturer in mineralogy at the University of Pennsylvania. His maternal uncle, Timothy Conrad, was one of America's earliest paleontologists. So he grew up surrounded by scholars who studied geology and paleontology. Though he lived in the city of Trenton as a boy, Charles spent time exploring family farms on the high bluffs overlooking the Delaware River south of the city. In adulthood, he would live on one of these properties, a farm he named Three Beaches, with his family, and it was there that he obtained his archaeological collections. Abbott earned a medical degree, but was by all accounts a terrible doctor. His abrasive personality contributed to a poor bedside manner, and according to his diaries, he was also quite squeamish. When he moved to Three Beaches Farm, he attempted to make archaeology his full-time occupation. Amateur archaeologists of the 19th century typically collected artifacts exposed on the surface of agricultural fields in areas near where they lived, and Charles Conrad Abbott was no exception. The farm contained an unusual confluence of environmental conditions that favored a more or less continuous occupation from prehistoric until modern times, as evidenced by a rich and well-documented archaeological record. Today, the property is considered archaeologically significant and is a National Historic Landmark for its contributions to our understanding of the past 6,000 plus years in the Delaware Valley. And modern archeological investigations on sites on his farm have greatly increased our knowledge of the trajectory of human occupation in the region. The farm was purchased for Abbott, his wife, and their young and growing family by his wife's father, Job Olden. And if you've ever spent any time in Princeton, New Jersey, you know of Olden Street, named after their very prominent family. However, Olden knew his son-in-law well, as Abbott was stubbornly lazy, and Olden stipulated in his will that the farm purchase was for his daughter, and at no point was the farm to pass into Charles's ownership, even upon her death. Abbott simply did not have the constitution or the will for farm chores. Instead, he preferred to sleep late, nap often, and follow his archaeological and naturalist pursuits. In one of his nature books, called Clear Skies and Cloudy, Abbott wrote, and I quote, There is danger in the unsunned air of early morning, and insanity is the result of two frequent lungfuls of the day at dawn, that farmers lose their sanity because of early rising. And if not quite so bad as this, at least their mental strength is prematurely weakened. Charles appeared to be in little danger. As farming proved to be a relatively fruitless and perhaps joyless occupation for him, archaeological and literary endeavors became a very important source of income. Abbott collected tens of thousands of prehistoric Native American artifacts from the fields surrounding three beaches and on neighboring farms. Most of these artifacts are today in the collections of the Peabody Museum at Harvard University, 
but others are scattered between the Pitt Rivers Museum at Oxford, the Penn Museum, the New Jersey State Museum, and the Smithsonian Institution, with a few artifacts at other museums as well. As part of the research for this project, my co-author and I spent many, many months working in these museums collections and archives, as well as years conducting fieldwork on New Jersey archeological sites. Now, influenced by his family's academic background, Abbott was well aware of changing attitudes towards science and the natural world in the 19th century. Though, we'll see, he stubbornly refused to apply scientific hypothesis testing to his own work. One of the big scientific questions being addressed from many different directions was the question of the origins of humankind. In 1859, Darwin published On the Origin of Species, which stated that the changes that are visible in species through time are the result of natural selection. Now, at no point in On the Origin of Species did Darwin address human evolution, but the applicability of natural selection to humans was certainly implied. Within this intellectual context, 19th century collectors, both amateurs and professionals, sought fossils of extinct animals, including fossils in direct association with hominins, which are early evolutionary ancestors to humans, or at least the stone tools of these early hominins. If their association was correctly interpreted, these tools were indicative of a very deep antiquity of human existence. In Europe, scholars found evidence of ancient humans in Pleistocene or Ice Age contexts. Now these ancient humans were our cousins, the Neanderthals, who look somewhat different from modern humans. Now, this is a Neanderthal skull. It's a cast from our archaeology lab. And if you compare this to the skull of a modern human, you'll notice some differences. So Neanderthals are closely related to humans, but they're not quite exactly the same. And this was recognized even by the 19th century. In this context, there were also artifacts from these Paleolithic sites, which included a standardized stone tool form that we call an Achillean hand axe. And they're like these. I have examples of these as well. So these are examples, these are casts of Achillean hand axes that are found in some European and also Middle Eastern and elsewhere sites and were probably made by Neanderthals as well as, as other species um, like Homo erectus. So keep these shapes in mind. Now, Abbott came to believe that he had similar Paleolithic sites on his farm. In his first published article on the subject, The Stone Age in New Jersey, which was published in 1872, Abbott presented a series of stone artifacts that bore a remarkable resemblance to the hand axe artifacts from Europe. Abbott theorized that these roughly shaped paleoliths, as he called them, were different from other Native American artifacts found nearby and instead represented ancient Ice Age hominins. Abbott said, that if ancient hominins, like Neanderthals, were making and using hand axe tools in Europe, then a similar ancient species must have been making and using them in New Jersey. If you look at his writings on this, he directly copied the European argument that roughly shaped stone tools at deep stratigraphic levels represented early Ice Age hominins and that the more shallowly buried and surface finds were made by the ancestors of modern people, in this case, Native Americans. As a result of these direct similarities, he argued, there must have been a prehistoric sequence 
in New Jersey, identical to that found in Europe. Abbott's claim for an American Paleolithic was was new, but it wasn't really earth-shattering. Scientists have been fighting to gain acceptance for similar sites in Europe for several decades by this point. And once their work received widespread acclaim, Abbott was able to simply follow in their wake. The New Jersey artifact mimicked Achillean hand axes from Europe, and when compared side by side, there was little difference between the two, according to Abbott. He felt this argument was incontrovertible. One could simply look at the artifacts from Europe and the artifacts from America and see that they were identical. And if they were identical, they must have been made by a similar hominin and in a similar Ice Age setting. In later publications, he gave these hominins the genus and species name Homo delawareensis. However, unlike sites in Europe that contained fossils of extinct Ice Age species in direct association with stone tools, the artifacts he found in New Jersey were not accompanied by fossils. So the age was much more tenuous. He invited scholars to visit Trenton and search for these Paleolithic artifacts themselves. But there were allegations that Abbott was salting the fields ahead of their visits, giving them artifacts to find, and that no one other than Abbott had ever found Paleolithic artifacts in the Trenton Gravels. However, despite this, during the 1880s at least, Abbott's theory was largely unchallenged. Now, let me step back a bit and give you a little more context about Abbott and why he was able to publish these theories in scholarly venues in the first place. Beginning in the 1870s, Abbott was sending artifacts to Harvard's Peabody Museum. Now, not just his alleged Paleolithic ones, but actually a very wide range of Native American belongings from sites on his property and the surrounding region. And he was receiving some cash in return. He wasn't technically an employee, although he liked to think of himself as one. But he was one of a number of unsalaried field assistants recruited by museum director Frederick Ward Putnam. These field assistants sent artifacts and were paid for expenses. Abbott received about $25 per quarter in the 1870s and 1880s, which would be roughly about $650 today. So not a lot of money, but enough money that it was worth his while. This was a common practice in the late 19th century, as museums worked to build collections from North America. It meant, however, that the archeological collecting was without much scientific rigor, and Abbott mostly just picked up artifacts while walking around his farm fields, or purchased them or received donations of them from other farmers. The association with Harvard, however, gave him a bit of an air of legitimacy. And in 1892, he was hired as the first curator of the American section of the University of Pennsylvania Museum. Now, spoiler alert, alert, he, he didn't last long. In the late 1880s, Abbott's artifacts were a centerpiece of Harvard's Peabody Museum's American collections. He reveled in the support and confirmation from well-known archaeologists and geologists. And in fact, most archaeologists and geologists, at the time anyway, accepted an American Paleolithic. His accomplishments catapulted him to fame and he placed him in the league with famous archaeologists of the 19th century. His book, Primitive Industry, was North America's answer to Sir John Evans' The Ancient Stone Implements, Weapons, and Ornaments of Great Britain, which was a standard reference for the European Paleolithic. Soon, though, everything would fall apart. In the winter of 1889 to 1890, William Henry Holmes of the Bureau of American Ethnology, which is now part of the Smithsonian Institution, began excavations at Piney Branch in Washington, D.C. This site had previously been interpreted as Paleolithic and contained extensive stone tool manufacturing debris and artifacts resembling the hand axes of Europe. 
as well as geologic strata composed of sand and gravel that were very similar to Abbott sites near Trenton. Holmes, however, conducted really careful excavation and paid particular attention to artifact provenience, where he found each artifact. He presented these data in meticulous profile renderings, illustrations, maps, a level of detail that was completely lacking in Abbott's work. And after only a few months of excavation, Holmes concluded that Piney Branch, and by extension perhaps all of the alleged Paleolithic in the New World, consisted simply of prehistoric quarrying debris of a much more recent age, and the artifacts themselves were merely evidence of early stage stone tool reduction, not the final product of Pleistocene hominins. This burgeoning debate at its core necessitated a really careful re-examination of the evidence and of the sequence and timing of Pleistocene glaciations. It required a re-examination of the archeological artifacts and of the entire scholarly paradigm. By the end of 1893, the American Paleolithic was on shaky ground. As the debate accelerated in the early 1890s, participants fell into two opposing camps. On the one hand, you had professional scholars who were affiliated with government institutions and agencies such as the Smithsonian Institution, the U.S. Geological Survey, and other what Abbott called the Washington men, who generally did not ascribe to an American Paleolithic. On the other side, you had archaeologists and geologists, some of whom were employed by academic institutions and museums, but who supported the American Paleolithic, but who were often amateurs, like Abbott, maybe highly educated, like Abbott with his medical degree, but with unrelated credentials. In fact, the first PhD granted in archaeology in the United States wasn't until 1894. And up to that point, American archaeologists were mostly self-taught. So the battle ultimately was between the big, powerful government and the small, independent scholar. And it turned nasty fast. One of the scholars who backed Abbott's work was a self-taught geologist named George Frederick Wright, who was a professor of the Harmony of Science and Revelation at Oberlin Theological Seminary. He published a book called Man and the Glacial Period in 1892 that supported Abbott's theories, and it was ripped to shreds by W.J. McGee of the Bureau of American Ethnology. McGee wrote that Wright is, and I quote, a professor of theology in a theologic seminary, yet lays claim withal to geologic skill, which serves to render his writing the more specious. McGee went on stating that he was incompetent, and I'm quoting here, incompetent to deal with geologic phenomena, and worse, that the introduction is absurdly fallacious, the chapter on glacial movements damned by error and specious misrepresentation, statements on glacial history crude, unjust, egotistic, and a generation behind modern science. And McGee concludes by saying, Wright is a betinseled charlatan whose potions are poison. Would that science might be well rid of such harpies. And this was published in the journal American Anthropologist. That's a, that's a legitimate journal. It's a peer-reviewed journal today. In response, Wright called for decorum, but Abbott jumped in with both feet. He even took on McGee and Holmes in verse in the journal Science. I'm going to read a poem of his now. He wrote, and again, this was published in the journal Science. Abbott wrote, the stones are inspected and Holmes cries, rejected, they're nothing but Indian chips. He glanced at the ground, truth fancied he found, and homeward to Washington skips. They got there by chance, he saw at a glance, and turned up his nose at the series. They've no other history, I've solved the whole mystery, and to argue the point only wearies. But the gravel is old, at least so I'm told. Halt, halt, cries out W.J. It may be very recent, and it isn't quite decent 
for me not to have my own way. So, dear WJ, there is no more to say, because you will never agree that anything's truth, but what issues forsooth from Holmes or the brain of McGee. Now, he published this in the journal Science. There was a lot of harping back and forth. But eventually, Abbott sulked and withdrew, and he soon found himself isolated and unemployed. The Penn Museum terminated his position as curator at the end of 1893. His reputation was ruined, and he's remembered today for his failures. Abbott's ideas about early humans in the New World were a product of scientific thought of the 19th century. Scholars who were just beginning to consider evolutionary theories and new finds from Europe. Given what we know now, Abbott's idea that early hominins, his Homo delawareensis, predated Native Americans seems silly, but we have much more information. Within the context of late 19th century knowledge, Abbott expected a Paleolithic that looked like that of Europe. His fault is in not following rigorous archaeological methods, even when measured by those of the time, and mulishly refusing to consider alternate explanations, ignoring data that falsified his hypothesis, and petulantly withdrawing from debate. He's certainly not the first or the last to behave this way. Abbott's Three Beaches Farm never yielded the evidence of Pleistocene occupation that Abbott had alleged more than a century and a half ago. In fact, none of the extensive archaeological investigations conducted there later by archaeologists like Ernest Volk, Dorothy Cross, Louis Berger and Associates, and others who followed revealed any evidence of an American Paleolithic, despite excavations that extended well into the deeper levels of the Trenton Gravels. Instead, the wealth of archaeological data we have from these sites is associated with Native American ancestors from later periods of, of prehistory, not a glacial or immediately post-glacial occupation, as Abbott had argued more than a century before. More than seven years after Abbott's death, archaeologists finally discovered and documented indisputable evidence of human antiquity in the New World at the end of the Pleistocene. Unfortunately for Abbott, it didn't come from Trenton, New Jersey, but instead from a Pleistocene bison kill site near Folsom, New Mexico. The Folsom site, excavated in the mid-1920s, contained distinctive fluted spear points in direct association with Pleistocene bison. These spear points were vastly different from the alleged Paleolithic artifacts that were argued by Abbott and others to be the hallmark of Pleistocene occupation in the New World, but their discovery in situ embedded between the ribs of an Ice Age mammal left little room for doubt. Pleistocene occupation of the New World was proven, but it did not look anything at all like Abbott's vision. Soon after Folsom was discovered, other Paleo-Indian sites also were revealed. Sites like Blackwater Draw, New Mexico, containing Clovis points that date to as much as 13,000 years ago, were excavated in 1932, and others, including Meadowcroft Rock Shelter in Pennsylvania, and the Topper site here in South Carolina, Cactus Hill in Virginia, and Manus Mastodon in Squim, Washington, and others, place humans in the New World in the latter years of the last glaciation. Today, there's little doubt that the earliest humans in the New World were ancestors of Native American peoples. Thank you very much. Music